Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. Episode 16, The Need to Smash the System, featuring Christine Mattis. Christine Mattis received her Ph.D. in Environmental Studies. As an interdisciplinary environmental scholar with a background in biology, earth system science, and policy, her research focuses on environmental risk information and science communication. Before returning to graduate school, Christine worked as a medical researcher, as a science reporter for the U.S. Congressional Record, and as a science and health teacher. She is no relation to the Mad Dog General. I've been a fan of Christine's writing for a few years now. More than once, I'd have a particular thought about current events rolling around in my head that I wanted to write about, but then I'd go online and see that Christine had already covered it. Few people are able to bring together science and compassion, or facts and ethics, or a sharp eye for both problems and solutions, as well as Christine does. Christine and I talked on June 1st and covered a lot of ground, including the dire state of the planet's ecology, the disarming of U.S. environmental law, genetically modified crops, the danger of overemphasizing carbon pollution as opposed to other kinds of pollution, the willingness of people to change, the George Floyd protests, the folly of the jobs, jobs, jobs refrain, the myth of progress, the narcissism of social media, the fruitless attempt to make capitalism green, and the necessity of profound paradigm change. Welcome to my show, Christine. Thanks for having me. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. And tell us a little bit about your background. You have a science background, I believe. Yeah, I have a bachelor's degree in biology. And I was originally went to school to go into medicine. And after four years of school, and after a year of working in a hospital, I decided that it wasn't where I wanted to go. I was, I was much more interested in the um, the prevention of medical issues rather than the um, the use of medicine for health. I, in, I, I feel like there's not a whole lot of prevention in healthcare right now or hasn't been for a long time. So I, I started getting more and more interested in the environment and how the environment affected human health. And from there, I was more interested in how the environment affected not only human health, but the health of all of our ecosystems. And um, I went on to get a master's in earth system science and policy and a PhD in uh, environment and resources, both of which were highly interdisciplinary programs that encompassed um, social sciences and natural sciences. Because the truth is, I think we realize now that how interconnected our economy, our politics, our policies, um, our society, and our health and the health of our environment are. And we're not going to solve any of our issues that we have all of the broad issues without um, bringing together all these aspects of our lives. Um, And so these programs that I did my graduate studies in tried to bring all of these kinds of pieces together. And when was this that you were in, in school for your master's and your PhD? That was in the mid to late 2000s. So I had a gap in my education. I was, I uh, graduated from college and I worked in education. I worked briefly in, in the House of Representatives in um, Congress. And I, um, then I went back to school after about 15 years of being out of school because I finally decided I really wanted to focus on the environment. And I actually, when I was in my undergraduate program, I, there were really no opportunities, at least the school where I was and working on the environment, these issues were kind of, I mean, 
people had a consciousness about it, and I certainly did. But um, in a lot of uh, universities, I think these issues were sort of um, on the sidelines. And all of these environmental programs have grown tremendously since then. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> it doesn't seem like our our solutions have grown, or at least our implementation of our solutions have grown, because we haven't seen much progress. Right. And you mentioned in a recent column that we just had the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. And I was thinking about that when when it happened, where Earth Day, I think, gave people the impression that we were doing something. And a lot of the environmental laws that came in around the same time that Nixon signed in, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, all made it feel like there was some progress that was getting made or that we were on the right step. And yet, I think if we look over the past 50 years, we've not actually seen an improvement in the environment. Right, right. Overall, we haven't. And it's funny because, well, first of all, um, if you really look into um, all of the programs that Nixon implemented, and I would say he he was the most environmentally um, responsive president we've had in in my lifetime, at least, or in the last 50 years. People don't like to hear that. And it wasn't because of Nixon. It was because of public pressure and, the, you know, the political atmosphere at the time. But um, but once all of those, the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the EPA, all of those um, those institutions and those policies were implemented, they were immediately, the rollback was beginning. And they, you know, um, they were never as strong as everybody thinks they were. And when I was in graduate school, people would say, isn't it amazing? Our, our water is so much cleaner. You know, we, we, we had the water used to be on fire in Cuyahoga. Um, and uh, the, the Cuyahoga River was set ablaze. And that was part of why we got the Clean Water Act. And, and the thing is, if you really know about um, toxification and pollution, you know that just because we're not seeing the dirty water or water is not set, being set ablaze nowadays, the, the amount of toxics in our water supply and in our air, I don't think um, quantitatively would be any less. There's so many things that we don't account for and we don't measure in our water. I mean, the PFAS that's become a big issue um, there's something that we haven't measured and we haven't had regulations on. And, you know, we there's so many things like drugs in our water supply and so many chemicals that we don't measure or we don't keep at levels that are safe and we don't even account for. And so people think it's clean because the science isn't done or the, we just say that it's clean water and we don't see these things, but they're there. And it's it may be even worse than it was when water was being set on fire because of the chemicals. Because there are certain chemicals that are being used more. For example, I interviewed on this show a couple weeks ago a woman named Samantha Zippora, and she's a women's reproductive health educator. And she mentioned that 60%, fully 60% of the women in the United States uh, who are of an age where they should be having a period are not having it on a regular basis. And this is due in part because of all the hormones that are in the water supply at this point. Absolutely. Hormones in the water supply, hormones in our products, hormones in the air. I mean, um, it was Theo Colborn who recently passed away in the past few years. And she and a few others, um, were the ones who finally brought out the tremendous uh, problem of um, endocrine disrupting chemicals. And they were, when they first brought this out, endocrine disrupting chemicals, they were sort of laughed at like this isn't really a thing. And now we know endocrine disruptors that are, are so many of the chemicals in our products and pesticides, um, these PFOS chemicals, there's, they, disrupt our endocrine system, their hormone mimics, and they wreak havoc not just to our reproductive system, but basically to all systems of our, our body. And we're seeing it in reproductive ways, but we're seeing it in all sorts of ways. We have we have a um, epidemic, epidemic of chronic um, medical syndromes um, in this country, chronic disease that most of which 
I call them syndromes rather than diseases, really, because we don't always know what why they're happening, what they're coming from, you know, neurodegenerative diseases, neuromuscular diseases, autoimmune diseases. And so much of this is coming from our our polluted environment. And we don't talk about that very much anymore. It's so funny because that's where the environmental movement really started with this pollution and these chemicals and these um, toxics. And now we almost talk about as if we've solved this problem. Right. Because another thing that's increased since Nixon's time, and especially in the last 20 years, has been the use of glyphosate and other herbicides in the agricultural field. And this has been due in part to the fact that Monsanto has created genetically modified um you know, crops, corn, soy, etc., which uh, tolerate the use of the herbicides, which are not killed by the herbicides. Therefore, they're able to use more herbicides, and they are using more herbicides. Use of herbicides is going up. And unfortunately, the more that they use, the more that certain weeds are able to adapt to this. So then they need higher concentrations of the glyphosate to kill them, or they need another chemical brought in entirely to kill them. And so when it comes to agriculture, the whole situation has been getting dirtier over the last 20 years. And of course, agriculture is in bottom lands, usually in valleys, draining right into the whole riparian network of the nation. Absolutely. And you know this so well. Um, and it's, it's, it's ironic or not ironic. It's typical of advertising that Monsanto would put these genetically modified uh, crops out there and the substances, the herbicides used um, with them and say that these crops are going to bring down pesticide use, bring down herbicide use. And all they've done is increase it. And the funny thing also, and I've written about this before, um, the, of course, the environmentalists who warned about these kinds of things said that this was going to create an epidemic of super weeds once we get these genetically modified crops out there and all the herbicide use. And of course, that is exactly what happened. And I, I was actually in a class in graduate school where um, I believe it was someone from the Department of Natural Resources was talking about glyphosate and about genetically modified crops and saying that we would have never anticipated how fast or or that this super weed problem would have would have erupted like this and i'm thinking you are the professional you are the scientists and all of these environmentalists and all of these organic farmers told you this and they knew and they predicted it and they were always put down for what they were saying and it's it's really amazing because this happens quite often the science catches up with the people who um who kind of have the the, the no, basic knowledge and the know-how in these areas and the scientists are behind what the public knowledge is in some of this stuff. Right. Because, you know, some people would say that the, you know, we don't know if GMOs are really bad for people or bad for animal health of the animals that eat them or, or us. We don't, we don't know that. However, regardless of whether the GMO technology itself is is harmful, the fact that it has led to the use of more pesticides is a fact and is harmful. Absolutely. And the, and the fact is, and this is another thing the public doesn't really realize, is that the science is not complete. It hasn't been done. And I, I really hate how AAAS is always saying that the science is complete on genetically modified organisms and we know that they're safe and, and we know that they're safe to eat in terms of public health. And the, re the reality is the science is not done. We don't know that everything's safe. And every genetically modified crop and organism is different. We're taking different genes, putting them into different organisms in different places, and we don't exactly know we know how um, maybe certain genes work, but we don't know how genes work in coordination with each other. We don't know how gene expression works completely. And to say that every new modification that we do in a new organism um, is safe because we've done this, this particular one before, which is totally different than a new modification, is, is really quite ridiculous. So, yeah, I mean, the science is not complete on that. We don't have complete knowledge. So, again, um, 
one of the things that is really troubling is that no one really talks about the precautionary principle anymore. And that's kind of what it's founded on. When you have when you don't have complete scientific knowledge and there's the potential for harm, you know, just like doctors are supposed to do no harm, scientists should be looking toward doing no harm and and not waiting for the potential harm to be done, but preventing it and taking precaution when the possibility exists. And we don't we don't really do that at all in this country. The precautionary principle is basically can be summed up as if we don't know yet if it's going to hurt us, we need to not do it yet. Right. And 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 it's not and more than that, it's based on science. It's based on you know, everyone wants to say it's unscientific. I, I actually did my um, my master's degree on the precautionary principle, and there's a lot of propaganda out there about it, and everyone who is against it says it's unscientific, but it, it is based on scientific knowledge. The, the, the act of prevention is based on what we know and what we don't know, and I think a lot of people um, forget that there's a whole lot of uncertainty in science, so shouldn't we rather prevent the harm when the uncertainty is there rather than you know go ahead and wait till the harm is done and try to mitigate it which is which is the basic modus operandi of this country and most countries nowadays and so the precautionary principle that's a modern concept with that name given to it but at the same time its origin must go back uh, much further than modern times right yeah i mean it's I mean, I would I would suggest, and I'm no scholar on this, but that that is the basic underlying premise of most um, indigenous cultures and the way they live, and it's it's sort of a premise of more wisdom rather than data and information, and and the modern version of it, I would say, is trying to implement both the use of our data and our information, and then some wisdom. We don't, we don't seem to like to use wisdom in our culture, though. <laughs> well, I, I'm not sure if it's really present here very often in order to be used. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. <laughs> so I'm, I'm glad that we've been talking about the pesticides and the GMOs because one thing I wanted to hit on was the fact that when it comes to the environmental crises that we're facing right now, there's multiple ones, and this is something you wrote about recently, but there's been a focus the last, oh, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 years on climate that it seems to be pushing the other issues out and pushing them off to the side, you know? And so, you know, the big thing has become carbon and carbon pollution. And of course, that is an issue, but it's not the only issue. And by focusing on that one, we're now not paying enough attention to other things. Right. And yeah, and of course, it's to the detriment of us all. Yeah, someone who um, wrote to me called it climate myopia, and I would agree. And and also you could call it carbon myopia. And I've been I've been very frustrated about it myself when I was in graduate school and beyond, um, because I found that when I want when I went to school and I was trying to look at a broad picture, and it's actually really hard to be an interdisciplinary scholar and look at things from a broad um, perspective, because in in graduate school and academia everything is really reductionist. But um, could you say something about reductionism? Well, in you know, in the sciences, especially, but I guess in all disciplines and in all of academia, there's this there's this um, hyper focus on you know the smallest piece of something to study, and and in fact, really, the scientific method only works that way on looking at a small aspect of something, um, and so we we look at everything in parts instead of looking at big pictures. And I think we're in a in an era now where we need to, instead of hyper-focusing on a small aspect, we need to pull out and look at the big picture. And this goes along with like our health too, our, our human health. We're always focusing on the specific little uh, mechanism, say in the cell or in the DNA that causes something instead of pulling out and looking at the big picture of our our organ system or our eco our planetary ecosystem our biosphere and um in academia they're they're doing more systems thinking and looking at larger systems but for the most part they really focus on the minutiae 
Um, and I think that's something that really needs to change in terms of everything we do if we're going to solve a lot of these problems. I, I found, and this was back in the early 2000s, early to mid 2000s, that the focus was becoming more and more on carbon dioxide or just carbon and carbon emissions and, and climate. And we were, as I said, many, in many arenas, we're acting like we've solved the issue of pollution. We've solved the issue of waste. Um, clearly, we haven't because we know it's it's finally getting into the consciousness of people that plastic waste is a, a humongous threat. Um, but you know, we're focused, the, the entire envio- environmental movement seems to have turned into the climate movement. And so we're looking at technological solutions. And these technological solutions have um, drastic environmental uh, repercussions. And we don't look at those other environmental repercussions, because we think we need to just solve carbon emissions immediately. And, and again, like you said, it is it is a huge problem. Some people say it's the problem. I'm not sure if that's true. And I know some scientists think um, the toxification of our planet may be an equally um, um, huge problem. But it, we, we have to be able to look at the big picture and look at all of these things at the same time. We know that biodiversity and species extinction is one of the major problems along with climate cri- our climate crisis. And the biodiversity problem is largely due to land use and due to pollution and due to um, humans' overuse of resources. And the climate change that is currently occurring is exacerbating the biodiversity problem, but it is not the supreme cause of it. So we need to be able to hold all of these things in our mind at the same time and be cognizant of it and try to um, tackle it all at once. Yeah, there's been an unfortunate result too, to where people who are skeptical of climate science, for whatever reason, are then sort of write everything off, even though there's all these other issues. I mean, I I personally know some people who are a little skeptical when it comes to the climate, but they are aware of like, that it's good to eat organic food because pesticides are bad. It is, it is, they, they do know that the oceans are filling with plastic and this and that. And then we end up with these perversities like the uh, defense of nuclear energy because it is supposedly has a low carbon footprint. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really tough one. And I, and I've been seeing a lot of people um, talking about that lately because of this Planet of the Humans film and saying, well, nuclear is the answer and acting as if the the fourth generation nuclear plants and the thorium nuclear plants um, that aren't even in existence now, but are, you know, basically hypothetical, they will solve everything in there and acting as if there's no such thing as nuclear waste and also acting as if the, the nuclear issues we've had with Three Mile Island and Fukushima and Chernobyl have caused no irreparable harm and that no one's been, um, har- no one's health has suffered from that. And I think a lot of that has to do with, um, I guess I would call it propaganda, but there's certainly been health issues and the between the the official voices and the unofficial independent scientists who've studied this, there's a wide disparity of like how many people were harmed from Chernobyl and even the harm from Three Mile Island. Um, you know, I think the official United States says that no one was really harmed. And I know a, a scientist who passed away and he was he's written about it and done research about Three Mile Island. His name was Steve wing um and he was at the university of north carolina i believe and he's shown that there were there were many people who either died or were um physically harmed and and suffered health repercussions from three mile island so to say that nuclear is the solution i I think people are just so stuck on this way of life we have in this in this country and more more throughout the world nowadays that they can't, they're just being delusional because they're so scared of changing. And so there's not, 
there's no there's no talk about the different changes to our our lifestyles that we could be making in order to be using less even though some of these would be i mean many of these would be positive you know a, a house that's better insulated well now you've got a lower bill right right um yeah and then you know so much of it is we are being sold a bill of goods about how we have to live and what makes us happy and what um and what kinds of things we have to have in our lives to be sort of normal Americans and thriving Americans and prosperous Americans. And most of these things are technologies and they're not necessary. In fact, a lot of these technologies make us more depressed and more psychologically ill. Um, and they're, they're just making billionaires more money and they're so harmful to the environment and they're harmful to um, us, like I said, psychologically and also interpersonally many times. Um, and I, I think at the root of what we, one of our solutions for the environmental problem is um, envisioning a new way of life, really a different way of life that may not be as high on the techno industrial um, uh, ladder, but may be much higher on the comfort and emotional and psychological well-being ladder. Yeah, that that's hard for people to imagine and I think that you know, people get used to the life that they have and how it is, uh but then also people are are always struggling too. So that's the strange thing here is that we're living in this culture where where most people I think are unhappy with their lives to one degree or another. And then there's a the hesitancy to change. But is that hesitancy, hesitancy to change real? Or is are we just being told that people don't want that? You know, the same way that we're told that, well, everyone who's not in America wants to have the American lifestyle. Whereas you can talk to people who travel who say, well, no, that's not necessarily true of everyone you meet. Yeah, and I, I would agree. I'm I, I'm not sure that everybody doesn't want to change. I think we are we are constantly sold how we were supposed to live and what we're supposed to aspire to. And I think it's really hard to get away from that advertising and marketing. Um, and it's reinforced in our daily lives and it's reinforced if you're watching television and, and even if you're just watching um, um, film or listening to the radio, it's all reinforced in all forms of our media. Um, and I, I do think there, there are people who are, um, Yes, like you said, first of all, so many people, most of us are struggling and we know that the, it doesn't have to be this way. Um, so inequality is one of the hugest issues that we need to tackle that that goes hand in hand with our environmental issues. But um, um, but I do think there's like sort of I don't know if it's a silent majority, but there's a silent community that really does want to change how we're living. Um, and I've spoken about this before. There's a um, academic um, theory called the spiral of silence. And it has to do with people being afraid to voice like an unheard or, or what they see is an unpopular opinion because they're afraid of being marginalized and being um, shooed by society and being um, put you know, unaccepted. However, a lot of times those seemingly unpopular opinions are actually not so unpopular. And it takes someone to to voice them for others to say, yeah, I feel this way too. Yeah, this makes sense. And and more and more we are seeing some of this happen. We saw this happen with um, some of the things brought out like Bernie Sanders campaign, the Medicare for all and the free college tuition. Um, and, you know, some of his policies on tackling poverty and inequality that would have been thought of as unheard of before and and would have been thought of as something that you weren't allowed to speak of, you know, opening the Overton window is what they, what they say in, in politics. Um, and I think that's why it's important to to voice different paradigms and different conceptions of of reality and and how we can live because i think more and more people may be open to it but they're just afraid to speak it for fear of being put on the margins of society oh yeah well that social pressure is 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 real people don't want to feel 
rejected. And I, I'm certainly, I was grateful. I haven't voted for a Democrat for president since 1992, but I was grateful that Bernie was opening up the discussion as much as he was. And if he had been nominated, I think I actually probably would have voted for him just because, wow, there actually, this actually is some different talk. And regardless of whether or not he would have been able to implement any of it, just widening that discussion was, was really helpful. But we've also had this discussion widened again uh, with, with the, the coronavirus showing that like, oh, so much of what we think about is everyday life can be shut down. And there's... There's, um, I mean, to, to for a lot of people, it's well, it's not as bad as they thought it would be, or whatever. Of course, other people, it's worse, you know. But the change that we've had because of the pandemic has also been helping to widen that window of what's possible, which may have led to some degree to the uh, level of intensity that we're seeing in the protests right now around um, George Floyd's death. Yeah, I I um I'm with you. I haven't voted for a Democrat and it, for president either and I was considering Bernie and I I w the one thing about him and as I said I worked in the House of Representatives actually when he was there and I think he would have I, I don't think he went far enough with with his um the policies that he was um putting out there but I I do think he would have listened to so many other voices that uh, most Republicans and Democrats never listen to. Um, but on the, the issue of the pandemic and these protests now, um, yeah, I think that closing down our country or most of our country really has made people think about, you know, what's important and who's important in our society. Um, and I, and I also think it's also greatly shown, um, who is being exploited, who is being marginalized, um, how unequal our society is. And it's unfortunately, it's only going to get worse because, I mean, so many people are going to be left impoverished and many more people are going to be left homeless. And um, one of the reasons I think that this George Floyd murder, and I'm going to call it a murder because that's what it is, uh, was a tipping point was not only because of the pent up rage of the black community who has been marginalized and exploited and terrorized for so long, but also because of this pandemic where they're seeing everything that's been so bad just get worse for them and for so many people. But of course, the black community um, has historically always had it pretty much the worst other than maybe Native Americans um, in this country. Um, so, yeah, I think Chris Hedges has spoken of this uh, very well. You know, the the revolution is bound to happen with the inequality we're facing in this country, with our ecosystem just collapsing. And uh, who knows what was going to set the spark, but it seems like the spark has been set. And let's just hope that um, everyone can use this time. Uh, con well, I don't want to say constructively because I don't want to. Um, disparage the way anybody's reacting to all of the all of the systemic uh, racism and oppression that's been going on. But um, I hope we can come out of this somehow in a positive way and um, overcome the oligarchy and the plutocracy. I guess that's the major thing we need to do. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You you uh you wrote recently about the pandemic. Our way of life is the public health crisis, you said. And you said the new mantra of the pandemic is, quote, we're all in this together. Since when? Since two weeks ago? If we were always in this together, we would have fashioned an egalitarian society that serves everyone's basic needs instead of greed. Not for this moment, but forever. We wouldn't have empty extra homes while others sleep rough. We wouldn't have hungry citizens while others feast. We wouldn't have multimillionaires and billionaires while others can barely cobble together an existence. Right. And I think that's part of what we're seeing with this rage and anger, all the systemic oppression that's been going on, and especially to a particular community, the black community in our country. Um, yeah, I, I, I was just... It just horrifies me every day when I hear people saying we're all in this together because 
we aren't in this together and we weren't. The billionaires are making more and more money now. Um, the, you know, not only um, are, is systemic racism occurring, and in the past couple weeks, we've had three people um, murdered. Breonna Taylor, um, George Floyd, and Ahmaud Aubrey. Uh, but, but beyond that, we, we were talking about the environment. Many people are talking about how this pause in the coronavirus has you know, cleaned up our air and, and reduced carbon emissions. But actually, there's so much environmental harm going on with the plastics we're using and all of these resources we're using and all of these disposable products we're using. So, I mean, this is why I talk about our whole way of life needs to be different. And part of it is I think we need to aspire to, as we were talking about earlier, aspire to something totally different. We can't, we can't keep aspiring to this uh, neoliberal bourgeois existence and this highly industrial, highly technocratic existence. It's, it's not going to end racism. It's not going to end our ecological collapse. It's not going to end the climate crisis if we are all aspiring to the same way of life. Um, and, and actually, all of those things are, come from this way of life our hierarchy, our inequality, our poverty, they're all, they're all um, part and parcel with this way of life we've created. So I think at the root of it, that's what needs to change these paradigms for how we want to live. In a state of shock after the war, we interrupt our program for a brief message. If you appreciate this podcast, please consider supporting Colibri on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Colibri. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. And now, back to our regularly scheduled... You wrote in that same essay, we humans are biological beings, not economic beings. Organisms, not workers. We are not homo e economicus, we are homo sapiens. We were not born to find occupations in consumer capitalist economy. In fact, for most of the 200,000 year history of our species, we did not. Yet we have been spending centuries now mostly ignoring physical and biological reality. We cling to the entirely synthetic construct of capitalism that cannot help but degrade our biosphere and destroy our physical well-being. Yeah, I, I think one of the things, the reasons I wrote that is because I keep hearing people talk about jobs, jobs, jobs as the solution to everything, as long as everybody has jobs. And we forget that um, so many people have jobs and are still homeless and are still impoverished. The exploitation we have in our jobs is unbelievable. And the low wages and the poverty that goes along with working, um, and, and it's insane that it's insane that people, and this this sounds radical to people, but it, it's not radical. It's insane that people have to go to a job in order to have a roof over their heads and food in their mouth and the basic necessities they need to exist. Um, you know, like I said, for 200,000 years, Homo sapiens have existed. We didn't start off having to go to a job to get food or having to go to a job to have shelter and that we've internalized that this is all normal, that someone say someone who cannot work forever for some reason, who has a disability, that that person shouldn't be able to have the basic necessities of existence because they can't have a job or for, for whatever reason, someone can't work. It, it's just insanity. Um, not to mention we, we think jobs are the be all end of all, all of our life because that's what in the last, I don't know, 100, 200 years, that's what everything's been about. You're born, you go to school and you're looking to have a career and career is everything. Well, so many of these careers are exploitative of people in our own country and around the world and exploitative of the environment. And they are the reason we're in this predicament that we are in. They're the reason that people are impoverished. They're the reason our resources have been used 
all over the world. They're the re reason we're in climate collapse. They're the reason we have pollution and waste. So to tie our lives into jobs that so many of them do so much harm is utter insanity. And it's a, it's a kind of mental paradigm that I think um, like Vandana Shiva uses the word colonization of the mind. And we've been colonized by this paradigm that needs to really be thrown away, I think. Yeah, because there's no collective memory just among us people of how we used to live before. This is something you have to look up. Right. I was thinking about um, when I taught environmental studies and we had our students um, do a midterm and a final project. And um, our students could come up with their own projects, but we gave them some ideas. And one of the ideas was to do sort of an environmental history of a certain area where we were at the university, a, a certain nature preserve, I believe it was. And interestingly, um, I think to a person, every student who chose to do that project never went in, in their historical study, never went beyond like 100 or 200 years prior in history. They completely forgot that, you know, white people had settled this country and that there was a whole other group of human beings living in that area and thriving in that area before white people came. Yeah, I, you were you were correct that 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 some of the some of this, especially the part about jobs, uh, only goes back a hundred or two hundred years. And yet, of course, as you know, some of it goes back further. Um, patriarchy really is tied up with the beginning of of agriculture, and of course, so is property. You know, right? So right. is money. So is uh, the monotheistic religions came up at that time. Like a lot of trouble started then around 10,000 years ago. But then, yes, it was about 150, 200 years ago with the, you know, the speeding up of the Industrial Revolution and making all these factories and being like, oh, well, we can't let the majority of the population live on farms and rural areas, which they were at the beginning of U.S. history, for example, you know, now and then that's when they started herding people into the cities and putting them into the into the factories, you know, and I don't know if you've heard of, you've probably heard of Lewis Mumford, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? He, he, he has a really great book, uh, uh, Technics and Civilization, in which right. he writes about the fact that this idea of progress, which is not a scientific idea at all, it's really kind of a religious idea in some way, that this came about in the 1800s at the very time uh, when everyone's quality of life was beginning to decline, you know? So mm -hmm. instead of living in these, you know, rural areas where one is self-supporting to, to a large degree or, you know, self-supporting with a community of peers, you know, that's when the landscape started to get ripped up for the coal mines. That's when people uh, got shunted into these these new lives where, where they uh, had to live by the clock, you know? Uh, this is when, you know, he points out that, People were aware that the fabrics that were being created by the machine looms in these factories were lower quality than the fabric that had been produced before by hand looms. They knew this, and yet they went along with it anyway. So there was a knowledge for a minute that things were getting worse. Then they brought in this idea of progress and then pushed it forward, and we're still sort of under that spell right now. Right, right. And it's done irreparable harm to uh, society and to the environment. Yeah, um, it, it's it's interesting because there's so much to unpack there and ab absolutely you're all right about all of it. Um, and I was just thinking about, you said about um, the quality of, of life and the quality of products going down. And I, I mean, I've just seen this in the past, I'd say like 30 years, the quality, uh, you know, go out and for those of us who don't, who aren't rich and can't, you know, buy the highest quality products, even though we should all, all product, products should be of the highest quality. But if you go out and you just need to get a new t-shirt, I, I think about how t-shirts, a cotton t-shirt was in the 80s and how thick it was. And in fact, if I have some of my old t-shirts, they still last. And if you go buy a cotton t-shirt now, I could put my hand through it, it's so thin, and tear it just by you know, putting my arm through one of the sleeves. 
the quality has gone down tremendously, the exploitation has gone up, the inequality in our society has gone up, this division of labor and this idea of progress. Um, yeah, it infuriates me when I hear some academics talking about how much better things are um, now that we've herded into cities and we've created factories and we've created this, this you know, technological industrial society um, when so many people were self-sufficient and, and, you know, living a subsistence kind of life that they were fine with until they were herded out. And, you know, and many times their land and their, their life was taken from them and they were basically enslaved or, or, you know, put into indentured servitude. And all of this has to do with people's power and hierarchy. Yeah, totally. And and where we are here in the United States, it has to do obviously with the European invasion and, you know, the killing of all the people, nearly all of the people who were here before. And if you've read uh, 1491 or 1493, then you know that, you know, in Europe, they had already basically cut down all their forests. Their, their rivers were polluted. Their cities were very squalid places. They were running out of things. They were really happy to discover this new continent to exploit. And we've, we're sort of coming to the end of that story now. Right. And you know, it's funny, because look at look at what the billionaires are saying. Now we we want to go do the same thing to Mars. In fact, I, I believe it was in this frontline documentary I watched recently on amazon.com that Jeff Bezos basically was admitting that we've overexploited this planet and, you know, that we, we're we not going to save it. And as certainly we're not going to save it as long as Amazon.com continues to exist and grow. And he was just basically saying that, yeah, we're going to have to go to another planet. That's insane. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely I mean, insane. That's just not, that's not a rational thing to say. Well, I guess it's rational if your only thought is about your own profit and your own ego and your own success. And that that's too much of what's going on. And, and you know, again, going back to all of us individuals, our, in our culture, our egos are driven by our success in our careers. And it doesn't matter if that success is at the expense of other people. It doesn't matter if that success is at the expense of the environment. It's what we're told we're supposed to do. It's what we're told we're supposed to aspire to. And it, it is totally destructive. And that's the kind of thing that I've been talking about more and more because, uh, you know, people don't want to talk about individual change to solve our problems. And I know one individual changing can't do it, but a collective mindset of change and collective, uh, collectively adopting new paradigms might be what's what we need to do, because what we're doing isn't working. I really appreciate that you mentioned ego there, because that is a huge part of it. I think that the overinflation of the ego by our culture has been going on for a while, but that that process has accelerated and gotten worse over the last, I would say, especially 10 to 15 years from the internet and specifically uh, from social media. Absolutely. I was going to say the same thing. Yeah. I mean, and, and I think it's kind of documented in, in psychology, the narcissism has increased and and the self promotion and i was just i was just talking to someone about this the other day you know when i was brought up and when generations before me were brought up you weren't supposed to boast you weren't supposed to brag you weren't supposed to talk about all your accomplishments or how good you were you know even you weren't supposed to say look i got an a in my class or whatever you were you were supposed to be a bit a bit humble about that but our society has changed to the point where Everybody is over boasting about everything about themselves. We're all personal self promoters and marketers. We're all supposed to create our own brand. And, and for those of us who don't want to do that, who are uncomfortable with that, um, we are just lost in the wayside and we are just, um, we can't make it in this world, really, if you're like that. And if you're an introvert or something, because everything is about narcissism and it's, it's exalted this narcissism and it's it's reinforced it's reinforced by 
the technology itself, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the likes and the thumbs up. Yeah, it, it's, it's a Pavlovian kind of reinforcement. And it's really sad. I've, I've worked with and taught um, young students fairly recently in elementary school. And I, I've run into students now whose dream is to become what they call, quote unquote, a YouTuber. Because they know they can make YouTube videos and basically have very few skills and have nothing to do but maybe sell products and talk on YouTube. And they could actually make millions of dollars doing that. And it's so sad that this is what young people are aspiring to. Right. I, to, to some degree, it's similar to how, you know, in earlier generations, maybe we would have aspired to be a movie star or, you know, a famous baseball player or something like that. But there's something, there's a different quality to it now that I would say is somehow more, more product of fantasy. Well, yeah. And, and yeah, there was always the aspiring to be sort of a celebrity. And, but, you know, <laughs> you could, you could hide behind when you were, if you want to be an actor and say you care about acting or if you want to be a baseball player because you're really skilled at the sport. But now so much of what's on media, and it's not just social media, it's primarily, but it's all over media, is just um, people almost exploiting themselves and not really doing anything skillful, but just being out there and seen and and making a career. Out of, and, and when we saw this, I guess it probably started with like Paris Hilton and then the Kardashians, but it's just grown from there. Right. It's been, to use the word that's often misused in this kind of way, uh, democratized. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> I, guess it, I guess it kind of is. Yeah, I guess it, it, it is democracy at some level. It's kind of a warped version of democracy. <laughs> Yeah, I, I totally know what you mean, though, about how everyone's supposed to be their own brand, you know, and I, I find the, the, the process to be rather wearisome. And I find that with my own work, with the, the writing and now with the podcasting and this and that, that it feels like there's some degree to which I'm expected to at least act in accordance to a form. And so there's, you know, a kind of game that I'm playing with myself for the moment anyway, where I'm like, okay, can I play into the shape of that form as I need to, you know, without it taking me over? Yeah, it, it's real. I, I think that's the really troubling thing, because when does it, um, when do you fall into what, you know, Herman and Chomsky call the media propaganda model, where, um, you're self-censoring because you know what you need to say to become successful and to, um, you know, to get a following. And when does it, when does your, you know, your media, whether it be writing or uh, podcasting or, um, you know, YouTube videos, when does it become more marketing than actual uh, journalism or information? And it's and it's really hard. And of course, you know, someone like you, you're checking yourself and you're aware of it and you care. But other people are just out there to sell their brand. And and I think that's one of the problems in our culture, too, is that we're having trouble discerning between one and the other. And they are they are slowly kind of intermixing. Some people are going out there trying to do something good and then kind of getting caught up in this whole self-promotion and marketing. Right. And I, I believe it, it sounds from how you're talking, I believe we're about the same age. I was born in 1969. Yeah, I, I'm a few years younger than you. Right. Okay. So we have we have a lot of the same memories. I mean, you you have mm -hmm. at least some memory of the of the 70s, you know, and of there being maybe four channels on TV that went off the air at night and a, a phone that was connected to the wall, and right. how different things were then, but then in turn, how different things were then than they were before. Well, like our parents, for example, were the first that grew up entirely under television, you know? Right. And so mm -hmm. 
uh, there's very few people left alive in the United States right now who have a clear memory of what it was like to live life in the United States without television. Right. right. And so now people who are our age or a little older, we have clear memories of what life was like without the Internet. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. I was an adult. I was in my 20s before I had my first email address, you know. Right. And so right. so so there's that to compare it with, you know. So now there's people who are growing up just in this milieu. And I do worry sometimes because I'm like, wow, I was already too disconnected just with TV and movies, you know, and now yep. the level of disconnection is even greater. And doesn't that make it harder to, you know, find our way home, so to speak? Yeah, I relate to all that. Yeah, I mean, it was funny, because I would say, you know, I was a good student, but I also was a TV addict as a, as a teenager. And, and I um and, you know, growing up like in the 80s when pop culture was at the time probably at its peak, uh, I you, you just could never have imagined what has become of pop culture and just culture and media since then. Um, you, you could have never foreseen, you know, millions of television channels and everything on the Internet and all of this, all of this distraction, really. And that's really what it is. And, and sort of to bring it back to the environment um, and what you were saying about uh, media, I think that's one of the problems is, and I wrote about this too, is we're now marketing the environment and we're marketing the environmental movement and we're, we're selling it. And I actually had a professor who talked about that, you know, the environmental movement isn't working and it needs to, it needs to be marketed. Well, the problem is when you're marketing things, you're, you're really um, using tools of manipulation and public relations. You know, you, you're not giving people a full picture. You're not giving people the truth. And that, that might work when you're doing, when you're selling a product because that's, you're just there to make money and you're just there to have people sell a product. But when you're dealing with something that's real, like saving the environment and trying to prevent ecological collapse, you can't use the tools of marketing and just get people on board with um, simplistic and sometimes somewhat false messages. Um, and so this is this is the the kind of thing I'm seeing now and 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 really feeling weary about that we're we're having people think that the environment is just about new technologies and new ways of getting energy and um we're we're selling them a false product and because that's what marketing does yeah and obviously it uh benefits a certain class of people that we look at it that way right and that's why it's happening right and that's why you know there's with the big environmental organizations and, and then so many people, just individual people who are working in the environment, the ones who are successful, actually, I should say, um, they are the ones who have um, made alliances with big corporations and with all of the, the people in the institutions who have done the harm in the first place. And there's no way we're going to fix this predicament we're in and we're going to get the solutions from the people who created the harm and created the organizations and institutions that um, put us in this predicament in the first place. Benefit, they benefited from the harm, and now they're trying to benefit from the solutions. Yeah, and there's been some writing about this. Uh, Corey Morningstar has, has written about this, about all the different connections between the big foundations and all the big green organizations and how there's an attempt at this point by some people anyway to sort of green capitalism, as it were. Yeah, and this has been going on. I saw it. I saw it myself firsthand with foundations and with environmental organizations and with with academic institutions. Um, the the big mantra was was um, you know public private partnerships and win win solutions, meaning win for corporations, win for capitalism, and win for the environment. And w it, it has been totally unsuccessful, and we know it doesn't work because when you're when you're looking to make money and profit and when you're looking to fix the environment, that one of the two is going to 
be the ultimate winner and the economy always wins over ecology. And when markets change and when um, conditions fluctuate, then the environment's going to end up being the loser and, and public health too, because that's very much connected to the environment. Um, so these, these kind of win-win solutions aren't, aren't win-win at all, but that's where, that's where it's all gone. Yes. Like you said, in the past 10, 15, 20 years, that's what I've been seeing. And I know Corey Morningstar has written a lot about that, about these connections and they are real. Yeah. And, you know, I have a friend who worked with 350.org for a while in Portland and he found a couple of things. One, the 350 uh, group in Portland was more radical than sort of the national level of it was, you know, mm -hmm. then. And that's just generally because Portland is a little more liberal than other parts of the U.S., you know. But then he also found that the people who supported 350, you know, who would come out to actions, you know, ordinary people who wanted to do things, you know, to help out, that they were themselves more radical than the leadership of the local 350. Yeah, and I I, I feel it was that way in academia, too. I, I saw as a graduate student myself and a lot of the students that I was in school with were far more radical than the professors. And it's, it's almost, it, it really is it, the sort of mantras that once you become, um, once you become one of the establishment, you know, you, it changes you. Um, and it's, it's the people sort of in the establishment that are making the rules, but they're not looking for the real changes. And, I don't know how we get out of that mess, um, but it's so true. The, pe the people at the bottom sort of and the people who don't have the voices and who don't have the um, positions of power are the ones who are really trying to make the changes. And they're sort of being squelched by those who have the power and the voice in the environmental movement and in so many other movements. I mean, we're seeing this everywhere, it seems. Right. Mm hmm. You know, and then when people do react, you know, of their own volition in their own way, uh, this is often uh, disapproved of or even demonized. Yeah, absolutely. I guess the thing to say is that somehow we have to get people to understand that once you become part of the establishment and once or if you become successful in a certain career, and even if, if this is a, like a green quote unquote career, um, you, you, people have got to be skeptical of that. There is a reason that people can become successful and gain power. And usually it's, the, it's not a good reason. There's usually compromises that have been made. And when it comes to everything we're seeing now, the environmental collapse, um, the um, the protests on about racism, all of this is because compromises have been made on things that should not be and can't be compromised on. Right. Sort of in some of our whole conversation here, fuck the system. <laughs> yeah. I mean, really, we need a new system and it's pretty clear. And it, and, and that's why I'm, I'm so pleased. I mean, it's, it's hard to say you're pleased to see what's happening with these protests around the country when someone was murdered and many people have been murdered over the past however many years, well, 400 years. But, you know, since the establishment of this country and slavery in this country. But um, it's it's so pleasing to see all these people coming out and wanting justice and and saying this system isn't working and we're tired of this system and and alongside of that, before these protests erupted, we have all these mutual aid societies and and shows of mutual aid coming out. And that's so pleasing to see that people know the system isn't working for the majority of us. And we're going to have to help each other. And we're going to have to look towards new systems. And the people at the top, if you're watching mainstream media, and it doesn't matter if it's, quote, left or right media, they're all looking for things to return to normal and normal was always the problem. And, and that's why it's so pleasing to see people out in the streets saying, yeah, normal is the problem. The system isn't the, is the problem and we need to change all this. Um, and it's funny because what some people see is 
as rioting and, and, you know, horrible rebellion and violence, I, I see as, as something that has needed to be done for so long and, and something that, um, and the only thing that might be able to spark change because my God, everybody's telling us to vote, vote, vote and voting hasn't done a damn thing for, for people or for the planet. I get really tired of the voting thing. And then when they put forward these people that they do, I mean, the the argument that, you know, the Democratic person is less evil than the Republican one this year, if it turns out to be Biden, this is going to be the most difficult case they've had to make in a long time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's pretty clear. And of course, you know, like, um Glenn Ford from the Black Agenda Report, you know, was saying that Obama is the more effective evil. And in many ways, I do see and, and Malcolm X and, and uh, Martin Luther King didn't obviously didn't talk about Obama, but but the uh, liberal establishment and the Democrats, they talked about how they're sort of the more effective evil because they pretend to be on your side. And we've seen this over and over again. They pretend to um, care about the environment. They pretend to care about people of color. They pretend to care about the LGBT community. And um, and they haven't made any major systemic changes for any of these things. In fact, you know, um, it was in terms of the LGBT community, LGBT, et cetera. <laughs> it wasn't it Clinton who had don't ask, don't tell, and Obama didn't want to allow... Um, gay marriage and you know everybody had to pull them to this but in terms of other systemic issues like racism and and uh the environmental predicament they are just putting a happy face and a and a word rhetoric of caring onto doing nothing essentially yeah no, definitely. I mean, business as usual is, is nothing or, or worse than, than nothing. That That's for certain. So, you know, it's funny because when we get into these conversations where we talk about these things, a lot of times people will then say, well, oh, well, what are we supposed to do? Or, well, what's the solution or something? And I think that it's not even us who who can come up with one. Yeah, I think we all have to come up with it. And like I said, this this mutual aid that erupted with everybody suffering through this pandemic and, and all the money from our government being given to the already rich and to corporations. And so the rest of us have to help each other. Uh, I think that's one of the solutions. We, uh, we, we're always expecting, you know, to vote someone in who's going to help us. It, ha it hasn't happened in my lifetime, pretty much. And so at this point, I think we need to help each other. And like I said, I think one of the biggest solutions is the decolonization of the mind and trying to get rid of these these internalized beliefs that we have for how we should live, what we should aspire to in this world, um, you know, and how I guess how we should treat each other Um this idea, I'll bring something else up too. This idea that we can, you know, live the good life, get the American dream, and then when we have all our money and all our security, we can help others through charity. Well, that that's not equity. That's not justice. That's not egalitarianism. Charity is just um, something to make you feel better about your privileged position. And we need to look look to eliminate charity and look to to create greater justice. And so it's these kinds of things that we've internalized as normal in our society that need to be completely smashed to bits. And again, that's, that's why I have m maybe what I'd call a little hope right now, because I'm seeing some people who are trying to smash some of these things to bits. And it's the people who've, who've had enough and who've had enough of the oppression and the wrongdoing um, and being... Um, hurt by the whole system for so, so long. Yeah, I'm, I'm also encouraged to see the uprising. I am disturbed by the right wing element, which seems to be entering at this point as well, where we now have been having enough reports from Minneapolis that we know it's happening, that there's right wing people who are coming in 
and who are uh, busting things up, and they're the ones who are starting some of the uh, some of the fires and stuff like that at places that you wouldn't expect to be targets. Well, that's because they're in there actually just to stir up trouble. And I haven't heard the full story yet, but I had heard that during the protests in Portland last night, the Proud Boys, which is a white supremacist group, had, had right. gathered and were joining. And so that, you know, that's something that we need to watch out for in, in this part. And of course, uh, the media will be a big part, a big problem there because uh, they, they misreport these things just as a matter of course, you know, even even when their own reporters uh, uh, get arrested, they still can't bring themselves to say anything bad about the police or the system, you know. So so there's yeah. all that. But but what you said about decolonizing the mind now, that is work that all of us can do. Uh, well, must do individually to some degree that we are the ones who uh, are the only ones who can start that process in ourselves and push it along. And so that is some place where we don't have to wait for uh, anybody else. Right. And that's why I think these talks are really important. That's one of the reasons I write. And like I said, I think I think there's a lot more people who are open to different possibilities of our life and our future in this country and around the world, but those voices aren't being heard. And so um, one way is to get, is to use our own voices to get that out there, because I certainly hear from people who write to me and say, you know, I've been thinking that, in fact, I hear from so many people that say, you know, I can't talk to my family about this, or I've been marginalized and, and, um, disconnected from my family and friends because no one wants to talk about these things and no one wants to hear what I have to say. And so um, the more voices that speak up about, you know, really radical change, and I'm calling it radical because, you know, the IPCC, who's talking about the climate crisis and the collapse of our of our entire um, global ecosystem is saying we need radical change. And I think more and more people are kind of open to that and they're afraid to speak or they don't have a voice. And I don't, you know, I don't really have much of a voice, but I'm, I'm trying to lend what I do have to those people who aren't heard. Right. I think that that's one part of it for sure is the speaking up and the using our voice. And then the, uh, the complimentary part of it is the listening part where there's voices that we all need to learn from, too. Absolutely. Right. And and we we all have to find a way to be open to that, which is really hard in this society because, um, I, you know, again, being of a similar age, it, it's it's so weird how sort of jumpy everybody is and how reactive, quickly reactive we all are, and it probably has a lot to do with the internet to um, to totally dismiss something that you hear or totally dismiss someone so quickly and i don't know when or why that happened but um i'm i know i'm trying to be more cognizant of that and and in fact I, you know i i'm not always <laughs> as good as i'd want to be but i know when people have written to me and some people um the, and they are thankfully few and far between but some people have written to me disagreeing or not quite liking something i've um a piece i've written an article an essay i've written um i will try to really take the time to see what they've said and respond in a peaceful manner. And, and sometimes you realize that you're really not so far apart and you just have to break up that anger and break up that initial quick hostility that happens. And again, I think this happens because of the internet and the short attention spans and all of this, this um, mountains and mountains of information and stuff that we're exposed to. Right. Yeah. The Internet. I, I, I also feel like we can't even say enough about that. I had a friend who um, was looking at some posts on my on, on Facebook that I had put up. They had looked at something that someone had said on there and they had gone back to that person's timeline to see who they were. And this friend of mine said to me, wow, that person's really a right winger. And I was like, mm -hmm. hmm, that's interesting. I said, because that's actually a person that I know in person. Right. And it's a person mm -hmm. I know in person from before the internet, right? This is an old friend, right? And we certainly mm -hmm. don't, we certainly don't agree on a lot of things, but 
to just call her a right winger, that's oversimplifying. That's, that's taking, you know, some positions that she has that are being expressed in a particular way and now painting her with that brush. And it's like, but I know her personally and I would not characterize her as a right winger despite the fact that she has some, some views of a particular kind, you know? And so that's mm -hmm. what's happening is that the internet just sort of flattens everything or something. And, and, you know, when it comes down to it, this is by design because the plutocrats and the oligarchs don't want us all to come together and say, we want a better society. We don't want to be your slaves anymore. They want us all to be fighting amongst each other. And unfortunately, in so, so many years um, now, we've been doing that. And I think, um, I think it was Ralph Nader who talks about alliances between the right and the left, but basically alliances between, and I don't want to call working class and the oligarchy because as we talked about jobs, I don't even like to say working class between the haves and the have nots really. Right. And I, I think um, the haves want us to be bickering amongst each other. So we, they don't see, we don't see them stealing everything we have and destroying everything that's good on this planet. Yeah, because, for example, there is a somewhat of a consensus across what they would call party lines or right or left or whatever, that defense spending should be should be lower. Most people actually don't want this global empire and would rather see the money spent on other things, even if that's just on fixing potholes on the street that they live on. Right. And taxing the rich. I mean, there's so many things we agree on in the the 2008 bailout of Wall Street, I would say, you know, that was basically, that wasn't a left and right thing. That was a 1% winning and the 99% of any um, political persuasion saying this is wrong. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think that that's, that's what is being disguised from us uh, right now uh, by the Internet is what we have in common. What do they used to say about the news media? If it bleeds, it leads. You know what I mean? So it's the it's the need for drama, you know? Drama, and, and that's also part of distraction, I guess. Yeah. The bread and circuses. Right. Well, distraction, because, you know, people are just unhappy with what's going on in their lives, you know? Yeah, and we all need a little distraction. But, I mean, it, it, our distractions have become sort of paramount in our lives. So we talked for a little over an hour. I feel like we hit a lot of great points. And I also feel like that's a good length. Is there sort of any way you wanted to, to tie any of that up or anything you wanted to end with or that you didn't quite squeeze in? One of the things I wanted to say was, um, and in, back to the environment, I think one of the problems I'm, I've been having um, with like how people – are reacting to say the Green New Deal or, or the entire environmental movement is that I feel like there's too many people, there's so many people on board now more than probably than I can remember in my life, but it seems like there's so many people who, who for them the environment or the climate crisis is disconnected from themselves. They're looking to a hero, they're looking to a messiah, or they're looking to um, a policy that's going to change everything, a magic bullet that's going to make things okay. And I think um, the what we need to do is, yes, we need these, you know, larger scale solutions at a systemic level. And yes, we need major societal changes, but we also need to look at ourselves as part of that. And that I guess that goes back to when I say the decolonization of the mind and our way of life. And we have to look at at that seriously so it it's top down it's bottom up and it comes from every single one of us what would you how would you feel about it if i titled this episode something along the lines of um the need to smash the system that's great <laughs> it's fine by me that's that's how i feel voices for nature and peace is produced in the gila river valley new mexico usa on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. 
to become a financial supporter of this podcast and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit radiofreesunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.